Hello and welcome back to Speed Demon Painting. Today we are taking a deep dive into the Admiral's Tournament book, which was released by War Cradle Studios to help people with their matched play events. Of course, the rules found in here can also be used for regular standard games that you play with your friends, and it does seem to look like they are hinting at doing a yearly update of these, as these are the 2023 season rules. This document can be found online on their website and uh, it uh, contains quite a few things. The first one being a bunch of different rules about how to organize events, what you can do to sort of set up a, an, an event structure, uh, what type of forces are uh, to be used, etc. That's a lot of information that I won't be really doing a deep dive on because I believe that's very much still up to the event organizer to do so as he pleases. However, the more interesting table here is, uh, that's for everyone really, is how you can select your missions. Uh, you do so by rolling uh, two dice, the first one determining the column that you are using for your mission. So if you roll your first dice and it's either a normal hit or a double hit, you use the first column. If it's a blank or an exploding hit, you use the second one. And if it's one of the counters, a normal or a double one, you use the third column. The next dice that you throw determines the row of the mission that you'll be using. For instance, if your first die was a normal hit and the second one was a double counter, you would be using the Salvage Rights mission. And in this video, we'll be going over what all of these different missions are and uh, how to best play them, what different rules apply, etc, etc. So if you find this sort of thing useful, make sure you hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel for any future updates. As a side note, I'm planning to discuss the first column in this first video, being the uh, common encounters, uh, just to make the video not end up being more than an hour long, uh, just to do the whole thing. And uh, we'll be focusing on those for this, vi uh, this uh, video, and then we'll do another deep dive on the second and third one. Those are the new ones that have a bit of uh, extra spicy rules added into them, that can be found in the other ones, and I'm going to try to make it digestible and make sure everything is in one location, so you can get a better view of what's going on with those as well. One small little thing that can be handy for any player though is the fact that there is rules in here for what to do if your encounter wasn't able to be played out completely. Um, if you clock out, they say that once the match has ended, the event organizer will call a dice down, so no more dice are rolled, and all players should stop immediately, and any victory points are recorded as they are during the current state of play. However, if this results in a draw, then you may add the end of round VPs as if that round had ended normally and see if it determines a winner. Otherwise, the match is a draw. In this case, that means that there are rules in case you're not quite able to finish your game in an evening as well to determine the outcome. There's quite a few missions in here that uh, reward victory points at the end of the encounter. And technically, they, this would be the end of the encounter once the clocking out uh, is called by the event organizer. But like I said, none of this is really the thing that I wanted the video to be about. We're really looking at the meat and potatoes uh, of, uh, of this one. And those are, of course, the new missions and a couple of new rules that are going to go along with it. Because, um, you know, there's a, a few things like here, the fog of war rules that got quite drast uh, drastically expanded upon compared to, uh, to the previous version. If Fog of War is to be used, it now contains uh, four different rules that you'll be uh, that you'll be using. The first one being the actual Fog of War rule itself, and uh, it's quite a drastic one because for each attack made, the active player must re-roll all hit, heavy hit, and exploding hit results in the action dice pool. And this was even amended because this is an earlier version to just cancel them outright. So in the new rules, if you roll a hit or a heavy hit, those dice just disappear into the ether as if they had never been rolled. So you can't even apply re-roll effects to them, which is uh, quite a big deal. The second major change to Fog of War, uh, because that used to be obscured, by the way, for those people who didn't know about it, is that there is now a blooming effect. 
If a target unit has already made a shooting attack in this round, then they reveal their position by creating a visible bloom, explosions, etc. from, uh, from the attack. The fog of war rule is ignored, so the previous one, and uh, normal line of sight rules apply against initial targets with a bloom for that round. However, attacks made with a torpedo or bomb quality do not create a bloom, so torpedoes uh, go up in value, if you will, when these types of missions are being played because they will not cause you to become visible to your opponent. This is really a big deal because normally, in the previous versions of the game, you would always want to shoot at units that have not activated yet but this rule really does protect those units quite severely and uh, yeah you lose a lot of firepower if you're shooting at something that has not yet bloomed if you will a third rule concerning fog of war is the pro proximity effect um, something can never be protected by fog of war if uh, the, tar the initial target is within five inch of an enemy unit so an enemy unit can be used as a scouting unit if you will uh, for other units in the game to circumvent this fog of war so you can't use it also if there are any enemy srs in base contact with it you cannot be protected by fog of war because they will report on the position of the ship being fired at which is a cool thing you do want to get ships up close to the enemy to make sure that you can uh, put some firepower on them but this does come at uh, is an extreme bonus really for those types of forces that want to be up close with the enemy and uh, i can see mass 2 cruisers becoming more of a thing uh, if only to sort of help you out in these types of fog of, fog of war missions um, to help you out with uh, the proximity effect. And then the last rule for fog of war is uh, the fog lifts. Uh, it can disappear after a while, unless it's specified otherwise in the encounter. At the start of each round, the player with the initiative rolls a number of action dice equal to the uh, round number. So for instance, in round three, you would roll three different dice. If there is a double in there. So if two or more dice have the same results, once all the dice are rolled, the fog of war rule ceases to be applied for the remainder of the encounter. So effectively, the fog has disappeared and you fight the encounter as normal. That being said, though, by far the most lethal rounds in any game of Dystopian Wars are round one and two. So that's usually the one that will be dampened quite a lot with this uh, fog of war. So that's why I said that I can see like small mass two cruisers becoming more of a thing, if only to send out some SRS tokens as sort of an easy way to get some of the proximity going, because it is a rule set that we'll see quite often during the missions and uh, yeah you do want to be prepared for that one because it can really catch you with your pants down if you don't right then on to the first encounter so this is the first one from the first column and it's one that we know before it is actually the one called fog of war during the fog of war mission the fog of war rules obviously apply as we've discussed previously and uh, they also include the way to divide up the table in this uh, new document including and this is nice to see how you should divide up your table if you're using a 48 by 72 inch a table which is now the new recommended table size for anything over a thousand points and uh, i do agree that it is a much better playing formats to, to be playing on if you do so you basically make quarters that are 36 inches long and uh, are still 24 inches deep uh, if you divide up your table this way the actual objective itself is very simple in its description, so this is a very good mission to play if you're just starting out. You score victory points in the end phase of each round. Each player can score two victory points for each quarter of the enemy side of the play area that has one or more of their units completely within it and no enemy models completely within the same quarter. This is a tricky thing to achieve though when you think about it because the fog of war rules are in effect and that makes it very difficult for you to just blast your opponent out of a quarter straight away. So you're really going to have to think about your activations there of which ones do I think are vulnerable right now, uh, are susceptible to firepower uh, because you do have to clear a full quarter before, before you even can start scoring victory points. 
This is also something that you have to keep in the back of your head when you're deploying your force, if you're doing so in a very asymmetrical way, when you're dividing up your units on each side of the table, that can lead to a catastrophe in terms of victory points because yeah, you can lose those models quite quickly, opening uh, the, uh, the door for your opponent to start scoring victory points. Mind you, you can only score four victory points per round and you are unlikely to do so in the first two ones. So this is one where the cards are actually a pretty big factor still. Besides those cards though, the majority of the victory points are awarded at the very end of this mission. In the very end round, you can score up to five victory points for each quarter where they have one or more of their units in the quarter of the play area with no enemy models in that uh, square. So if you manage to achieve it in the end round, you do score very big in this mission. So it's all about setting up for that situation and uh, doing so, achieving the scoring mid game is more difficult in this one. The next mission is the hold at all costs uh, one where you uh, lay out the play area as shown on the deployment map. You get an 8 inch deep deployment uh, for each opponent and uh, the, uh, the idea of it, the objective of it, at the end of the encounter, so the final round, each player scores two victory points for each unit they have in their opponent's deployment zone. If there are no enemy models within 10 inch of that unit, you can score three victory points instead. This is the sort of mission that always forces you to take highly mobile units, for starters, or to start playing around with reserves as well. Uh, those are almost a key to victory for this type of, uh, of mission, because if you can start coming in from the flank and there by infiltrating into the enemy deployment zones, these are an absolute goldmine uh, for your opponent and some uh, for you yourself and your opponent really has to make sure that he's able to respond to any reserve units coming in because they are so key to victory in this one. Next up we have salvage rights. Now this is a slightly more complex mission. Um, each player after setting up and deploying like you're doing like this, you get three small debris markers which are approximately two inch in diameter. These are the same type of tokens, by the way, that you can find on the new plastic uh, sets like we found in the Beyond Sturginium Skies box and are also included in the new uh, campaign box that they are releasing. Each player alternates placing one of the debris markers on the play area no closer than 6 inch to an edge of their uh, deployment zone or any other token. So you take it in turns to place these uh, special debris tokens. These debris tokens are then used to determine the victory points during this mission as well. If a model is within one inch of one of those debris tokens at the start of their activation, they can make a single attempt to search, where you roll an action die and on a blank counter or heavy counter, the token is nothing of value and you just remove it from the play area. If you score a hit, heavy hit or exploding hit, the player finds a salvage token and gains two victory points. Once three salvage tokens are uncovered, all of the other debris tokens from the play area are removed. If there are two debris tokens left uncovered and only one salvage token, meaning a successful roll, has been found, both remaining debris tokens are automatically salvaged. So there's always three in play, of course, but to claim one, you still have to be within one inch of it at the start of the mission. During this mission, it's absolutely crucial to make sure that you focus your firepower on those ships that are able to claim a bit of salvage as well, if you want to avoid your opponent getting a runaway victory. There are six victory points to be made in this mission, so cards are still a very valuable secondary source of victory points in this one as well. And that's also something that you have to keep in the back of your uh, head if you're playing this mission. Make sure that you use your victory and valor cards quite often or as often as you can for the victory effect. The next common encounter are the oil fields. Now, if you want to set up the board, you have to include two mass three inactive platforms. Uh, those are the larger sort of hexagonal uh, sort of platforms that come onto that plastic sprue as well. And uh, you place them as they are shown in, uh, in this diagram. Those ones are going to be the oil fields that you'll be fighting over during the mission. 
The objective in this one is at the end of each round, if you have a unit within three inch of the oil platform on your side of the play area, you get two victory points. At the end of each round, if you have a unit within three inch of the oil platform from the enemy side of the play area, you gain four victory points instead. There is no requirement for there to be no enemy units at all near to you. So just getting a unit in there can score you a p potential for victory points. This mission is one where you really, really, really want to have a couple of fast moving units in your own force. I'm thinking things like Jaeger destroyers, some Farraguts uh, for the Union. Uh, these types of units are absolutely invaluable for this mission as they can uh, quite easily get you a good portion of victory points very early on. As a side note though, you do not gain four victory points or two victory points per unit that you have within the oil field. You just need to have units within three inches of that oil field. And as a second side note, expect those units to take one hell of a beating from the opposing firepower um, when they do get there. So fast and durable. There's not that many units in the game that have both of them, but if you have access to them or you can make them more durable in any other way, that's also a very important key to victory in this mission. Next up we have the Rules the Waves mission, where you have the standard division into four quarters like we saw with the Fog of War mission. In fact, this is the Fog of War mission without the Fog of War rules, it seems, because it's the same objective almost. In the end phase of each round, each player scores two victory points for each quarter of the enemy side of the play area that has one or more of their units completely within it, and no enemy units completely within the same quarter. In addition, at the end of the encounter, if you do the same, you get five victory points as well for this one. So you can't score that many points during the game. Quite a lot of the victory points are awarded at the end of it because you do have to clear a quarter completely before you start, before you can start claiming victory points from it. And then the final common encounter for this first video is the Tempest, where you have the standard deployment zone of 8 inch on each of the uh, long edges of the board, and uh, you deploy in such a way. The objective in this one is to have units at the end of the encounter within the center, 12 inch of the center of the play area. So all of the victory points are awarded at the very end. However, there's also a very spicy special rule that is applied during this uh, mission. While the storm rages, so at the start of it there's a big tempest going on, drift is doubled for all units. On top of that, coming within 12 inch of the center of the play area is dangerous because for every unit that is in that area, um, you have to roll a critical damage dice. If the result of that one is a Sturgeonium Flare, apply against all the models in that unit as if they were struck by lightning. So it's rather dangerous to go in with like one little model in a unit, can result in a Sturgeonium Flare being applied to pretty much all the models in that unit as the lightning rages across that unit as well. At the start of every round, the player with initiative rolls a number of action dice equal to the round number. If two or more dice have the same result, once the dice are rolled, the storm has lifted and no longer has any effect on the encounter. So the same, the whole weather can sort of lay down and quiet down, is applied as if it were fog of war, it's innocence. This makes it a very <laughs> special encounter because you do move quite a lot faster during these uh, tempests, especially with flagships who are usually uh, quite heavy in mass and those ships have long drift distances but uh, don't necessarily have a lot of speed to go along with it. So expect your flagships to be really duking it out rather quickly in these types of missions or in this type of mission. And there you have it, those were the six common encounters. If you are a new player, I would suggest you start out with those six ones as they have fairly basic deployment rules compared to the ones we'll be looking at next. Uh, the next video will be about the new desperate encounters coming up, which uh, we have played uh, one of before and it, they really do add a new dimension to the gameplay. So I can't wait to get stuck in with those uh, missions with you guys and uh, I do hope to see you in the next video. Bye.